The 3DS era of Fire Emblem to me is an extremely fascinating time period of the series to explore. We have the dramatic development story of Awakening, which brought the series back from the brink of oblivion, and did so while breaking the franchise mechanics wide open, creating huge questions about what Fire Emblem gameplay even was anymore. The direct follow-up to it, the Trio of Fates games, shook up the status quo even more so, with successes and flaws so monumental that the conversation over their gameplay and story hotly continues to this day. The game at the end of the road for 3DS Fire Emblem, the 15th game Echoes Shadows of Valentia, seems at first to only be a straightforward update and remake of the second game in the series, which I have to admit is a bit of an anti-climax when it's put in the same era as Awakening and Fates. Whereas those two games mixed up their gameplay tremendously, Echoes only strove to be as faithful a remake as possible, and given that it was adapting Fire Emblem Gaiden, meant abandoning a lot of previously established series mechanics. Despite this apparent backpedaling, it's still fair to say that Echoes is one of the most beloved entries in this entire series history. In fact, this game is probably second only to the fourth game, Genealogy of the Holy War, and the sheer number of fans that have reached out to me to tell me that this was their favorite, and they have been waiting long for this exact video. All this time, this has always seemed a bit odd to me, because despite this game being very tied in with its source material, I don't think that there's many people, at least among Western fans, that feel the same way about the original Gaiden. In case you're just joining us here today, in my Fire Emblem retrospective series, I have chronologically gone through every game in this franchise, starting from a position of total series blindness. When I played the original Gaiden twice over, I only had the very first game for the Famicom in the back of my mind, and despite Gaiden's flaws, I still really enjoyed the experience. Now, however, I'm approaching Echoes with the 14 previous games under my belt, and to better understand this entry, I have played it three times over. In order to break down my experience, I will be separating this video into different parts, covering its development history, a story synopsis and then my analysis of it, and then finishing with a breakdown of the new gameplay mechanics and my final thoughts. Story spoiler parts will be noted with spoiler warnings and timecodes for you to skip ahead. And of course, you'll also find timecodes to all the different chapters in the description below. It has been quite the experience returning back to the land of Valentia after all this time, and I can't wait to take you along for the ride with me. Let's get started. Following the release of Fire Emblem Fates in 2015, the series had never been in such a strong place, and development on the next game began shortly after Fates completion. Originally, it was considered that the next Fire Emblem game could be developed for the upcoming Nintendo Switch, but due to a lack of knowledge about that console's eventual specifications, development began for a final 3DS game instead. Desiring a shorter development time so that they could begin developing a different game for the Nintendo Switch when it launched in 2017, Intelligent Systems eventually landed on the idea of remaking the second game in the series, Fire Emblem Gaiden, and for more than a couple reasons, this idea took root very quickly. Intelligent Systems at the time was very interested in using some of the features that they were unable to implement fully into Fates, with one of the biggest of those being the ability to freely roam through 3D environments, which were only minorly used in Fates for location-accurate backgrounds. Given that the original Gaiden already used explorable locations, a feature that other games in the series never went back to, it was seen as a perfect fit. On top of this, especially from staff member Kenta Nakanishi, there was a lot of love for Fire Emblem Gaiden, which many felt had become unfairly buried and forgotten about. Nakanishi, who formerly was a staff member at Nintendo, was elevated to being a sub-director for this remake, and although he was happy to help modernize Gaiden, his passion for the original game and its odd gameplay systems and mechanics led to him spurring on the team to keep much of the original, warts and all, intact. This was also pushed along by his personal history with the game, as Fire Emblem Gaiden was one of the last things he was given by his late father. With a commitment to both improving and preserving the original game, the development of Echoes Shadows of Valentia went smoothly, and included a change in art direction, going from Yusuke Kozaki, who had done the character designs for both Awakening and Fates, to an animation artist known by the pseudonym Hidari. Besides character design, there was also a change in direction of the animated cutscenes, which went 
went from Studio Anima to Studio Kara, which is most known for the rebuild of Evangelion anime series. Additionally, for the first time ever, almost every bit of dialogue was also fully voiced. Although it was originally projected for a release in September of 2016, the team decided that they could not finish within that time without lowering the quality of the final product and so the release was instead moved back to 2017, eventually pushing it beyond the recently announced Fire Emblem Heroes' own February 2017 release. Finally, this 15th entry was released on April 20th, 2017 in Japan, with worldwide releases coming in the next month in May. Although the sales numbers of this entry were nowhere near the millions of copies moved, as was the case with Awakening and Fates, this more modest project definitely performed well enough to impress, quickly becoming number one in sales in Japan, with a respectable seventh best in North America for the month of May. This was accompanied by loads of high scores, including various awards nominations. To go alongside the release, a huge amount of downloadable content in five different packs was released within two months of the release, eventually exceeding the price of the main game when put together. On this note, I have to say that I won't be covering the DLC in this video, as gathering footage for it is simply not a possibility for me right now, but it could be something that I return to in the future. In the next section, we're going to break down the story of Shadows of Valentia, and even though this is something that I have covered before with my story synopsis of Gaiden, I am still going to run through it again here, as this version is quite a bit more fleshed out, and of course we also have the officially translated names to go off of. As always, if you want to jump past my story synopsis and get right to my own analysis of it, you can jump to the timecode that's at the top of the screen. If you'd rather avoid all story spoilers and jump to the gameplay section instead, you can use the timecode listed at the bottom. Okay, let's jump back into Valentia in 3, 2, 1. The continent of Valentia, land of the gods, had long been divided into two nations, the land of Rigel to the north, founded by the god Duma, and the land of Zofia to the south, founded by the goddess Mila. Though initially in conflict, tension between the two countries eventually settled into a long-standing peace agreement, and under this fragile peace, hundreds of years ticked away. In the year 394, far to the southwest in Zofia, a young girl named Selica was playing with her friend Alm. Though the world outside the village was full of strife, life went on peacefully for the young pair. This day, however, destiny was about to catch up with these two. Arriving near the town with a cadre of soldiers, a man known as Slade spotted the two children along with their friends. Selica, unbeknownst to any in the village, including her friends, was actually Princess Antes of Zofia, hidden away by the knight Mycen for her own safety. Recognizing the unique brand on her hand, Slade immediately attempted to capture the young girl, but her friends quickly came to her defense, although the real work was done by the Knight Mycen, who swiftly came up riding to help out. Managing to best Slade and his cronies for now, Mycen realized that Selica would need to be relocated yet again, much to the sadness of her and her friends. Despite how much Alm begged for her to stay, or at least desired to know why she had to leave, Selica and Mycen both knew that they could not tell him. And so, these two friends were forced to be separated, with only the single promise to somehow, someday, reunite in the future. Over the next seven years, the youngster Alm grew into a fierce warrior, schooled in combat by Mycen himself. Selica, meanwhile, lived at a quiet priory on the island of Novus, and she had likewise grown into an intelligent young woman, skilled with both sword and magic. Outside of Ram and Novus, however, the land continued to churn with conflict. In the capital city of Zofia, at long last, the general Desai had managed to overthrow the former king and become the new ruler of the land though it was said that he did so at the behest of the Northern Regellians. This event came only a short time after the goddess Mila, who had long been the protector of the southern land, completely vanished, and along with her disappearance, a widespread crop failure had begun. Once again at this time, Destiny was catching up with the two young heroes. In Ram, a member of the resistance against Desai, called the Deliverance, arrived with the hope of recruiting Mycen to help them in their fight. And after seeing Mycen's unwillingness to interfere in this current conflict, Alm joined up in his stead. 
While this was going on, Celica, who was tired of hearing about the widespread troubles throughout Zofia, also set out on her own adventure to find out what had happened to the land and the goddess. Throughout southern Zofia, Alm and his group cut through the unchecked banditry and terrors that had taken root, ultimately arriving at the Deliverance's hideout and meeting with Sir Clive. Seeing how much trust that Alm had inspired in his followers, despite his roots as a commoner, Clive offered to him the same offer he wished to give Mysis that he become the new leader of the Deliverance, and take them to victory against Desai. While Lucas and many of the others working for Clive were more than willing to accept Alm as their leader, one of Clive's friends and officers, Fernand, was disgusted by the proposition of taking orders from a commoner, angrily storming out and leaving the group behind promising retribution for this perceived betrayal. Finally, with Alm in the lead, the Deliverance began their siege on Zofia Castle, and after fighting their way through the heavy resistance, they defeated Slade in battle and forced the retreat of General Desai. Shortly after his victory, Selica was arriving herself on the mainland after battling her own way through a different set of terrors and seaborne bandits. When word came to Selica that a young man had taken command of the Deliverance and ousted the despicable General to say, Selica deduced that this mysterious new hero could only be Alm. While rushing to the castle to see if she was right, Selica was immediately attacked by a mysterious group who wished to see her dead then and there. Although she was cornered, it was thanks to the intervention of one of her closest fighters and a different mysterious masked knight that she was able to survive the ambush. Finally in the castle, Selica was shocked to see Mycen waiting for her, who told her that yes, Alm was the one who had freed the capital, and he was currently planning his next move above. Rushing to her friend, Alm and Selica were overjoyed to be reunited, but when talk turned towards what to do about General Desai and the Regellians, the two began to butt heads. Alm had made up his mind that a counter-invasion of Regel was necessary at this point, while Selica became frustrated by his unwillingness to seek a more peaceful solution. Unfortunately, the pair separated again on a sour note, with Alm leading his soldiers further northwest, while Selica continued her way northeast to Mela's temple. On Alm's side, he successfully cornered General Desai in his stronghold before finally slaying him, and then moving his army ever forward until he was at the border of Zofia and Regel. Meanwhile, Selica ousted the self-proclaimed Pirate King Greeth that had taken up residence on the eastern coast, there freeing a member of Mila's temple that he had taken hostage. At the temple itself, Selica was despondent to find out that it had been the site of a battle between Emperor Rudolf of Regel and the goddess Mila, and that their encounter had ended with the Emperor sealing away the goddess using a sacred sword. Seeking further answers, Selica and Alm unknowingly worked in tandem to lower the river that separated the two countries by opening two different sluis gates. With the way open, they continued along their individual journeys, with Alm heading straight for Emperor Rudolf and Selica heading for the Tower of Duma to confront the leader of the cult that was dedicated to the Mad God. During Selica's travels, she had been continuing to encounter the Masked Knight from before, and it was at this time, during another encounter, that he finally revealed his identity. In truth, he was Conrad, Selica's supposedly deceased half-brother. Conrad had been saved by a man known as Sage Halcyon, who was also now awaiting her at a hidden village known as the Sage Hamlet. Deep in this forest of Eastern Regel, Selica met with the man face to face, who revealed to her that the sword that was used to seal away the goddess Mila was actually a relic known as the Falchion. Selica, who at this point was regretting the way that she had handled things with Alm back in the castle, asked if there was a way that the Great Sage could help her, and he did so happily, using his powers to not only unlock more of Alm's strength, but also to allow the princess to communicate with him over this very long distance. Using an astral projection, Selica appeared in front of Alm, and the two eagerly embraced, apologizing for how they had left things. Finally reconciled, Selica told Alm the truth about who she was, that she was actually the missing princess of Zofia all this time. Just after renewing their promise to reunite once more, finally the sage's magic ran out, and the two were again forced apart. Selica then continued on her path towards the tower, while Alm continued to ravage his way through the Regellian military on their home turf. 
Finally arriving at Duma Tower, Selica met with the High Priest of the Duma Faithful, Jeddah, who revealed Mila's ultimate fate. She had been petrified permanently, with the sword falchion still sticking out of her skull. In order for Selica to free her god, Jeddah demanded that she surrender, and offer up her own soul to Duma. Surprising even her companions, Selica agreed. While the princess was accepting her fate in Duma's tower, Alm was finally ready to begin his march on the Regalian capital. On the walls of the castle, Alm's group encountered the mighty emperor himself. And although he seemed posed to fight, Rudolf flat out refused to defend himself against Alm at all, even to the point of letting him attack and damage him. With the advantage on their side, the Emperor Rudolf of Regal was struck down. In his last moments, Rudolf spoke to Alm, admitting the reasons behind all that he had done. Early on, Rudolf had recognized that the divine dragon Duma was starting to degenerate and fall into madness. Seeking to buy a new future for the whole of Valentia, the Emperor ordered Mycen, his closest friend, to take away his son, Albion Alm Rudolf, away from Regel in order to raise him into the hero the land would need. All of the events since that day had been leading up to this very moment, where Alm, Rudolf's son, would return back to his forgotten home, strike down the former emperor, and take the throne of Regal for himself, now strong enough to take on the corrupted Duma. With the weight of his father's sacrifice heavy on his mind, Alm ultimately accepted his destiny. Taking only his most trusted followers, the hero ventured beneath the palace into tunnels that would lead directly to Duma's tower. And it wasn't long underground before he encountered Selica, who had been imprisoned by Jedha and was currently awaiting her sacrifice. Although Selica wished that he would stop, Alm refused, promising that he would find a way to unseal the falchion, which was still embedded in Mila's skull, and use it to take down Duma as well. Leaving her there, he then proceeded throughout the rest of the basement of the tower. And after fighting through intense resistance and taking down his cousin Berkut, who had gone mad after repeatedly failing to stop Alm's advance, the young hero at last made his way into the chamber where Mila and Selica were being kept. Unfortunately, by this time, Selica's soul had already been sacrificed, and after hearing Mila's voice encouraging him to take and trust in the falchion, Alm was forced to mortally wound Selica with it in self-defense. However, this was not to be the end. Using the last bit of Mila's power still contained in the falchion, the goddess's essence went out and into Selica, miraculously bringing her back to life. Happily reunited after so many twists and turns, Alm and Selica joined together in one single purpose, defeating Jedha, and then finally bringing the mad god Duma to a rest. In one final battle deep within the tower, the two fought through the strongest forces that the god and his followers could muster. But thanks to their teamwork and the assistance of both groups of their closest fighters, Jedha was ultimately slain, and the two then turned to take on Duma himself. After an even more intense battle, Alm, just like his father, plunged the falchion deep into Duma's head, ending with one last stroke, the age of the mad gods throughout Valentia. With both Mila and Duma now gone, Alm and Selica were left to lead the now united continent as husband and wife. Although they knew without the gods' gifts of abundance, the road ahead for their people was going to be a hard one, in this new age of humanity, the people, led on by their two heroic leaders, were finally ready to start moving forward towards their own fate together. When it comes to explaining my thoughts on the storytelling strengths and weaknesses of Shadows of Valentia, I feel that I need to restate that when I first encountered this world and these characters while making my retrospective video for Fire Emblem Gaiden, I was absolutely charmed from the start. Even when experienced through the filter of an extremely amateurish fan translation, the tale of Alm and Selica and their crisscrossing journeys throughout Valentia was immediately appealing. Of course, the original version of this plot also represented a huge step forward in terms of storytelling for this series, so even though I fully played through Fire Emblem 1 multiple times before I got to making that retrospective, Gaiden was the first game in this series to actually be coherent in its story. 
Alm and Celica, to me, were pretty much the first Fire Emblem Lords that I connected to, which is part of what made me feel so nostalgic during the chapters of Fire Emblem Awakening, where you return to the same land where this game is set. Even as I got further and further along in the Fire Emblem series, Alm and Celica's journey throughout Gaiden still stuck out as a personal favorite of mine. Its story is properly scaled for this kind of game, with enough battles, diversions, and big moments from chapter to chapter that make you really feel like you're in the middle of a sprawling historic event, but still one that you have to fight every inch for. Although there is probably overall too many battles between main events, this story structure avoids the issues of major changes feeling very slight because you only see the biggest moments out of a huge, sprawling war. This was all the more remarkable considering the limitations of its era, and by that same measure, Gaiden's main characters, namely Alm, Celica, Mycen, Rudolph, and the two gods Milla and Duma, actually did have enough writing to them to leave some very lasting impressions. In short, even though I'm about to say that what Shadows of Valentia does with its story, characters, and writing sets a new bar for this entire series as a whole, still, you gotta respect your roots, and this remake in particular was already working with excellent and very underappreciated material. Gaiden needed a refreshing, not a complete restructuring, and thankfully that is exactly what this remake does, and does incredibly well at that. So, as if it were any surprise, yes, the storytelling in Shadows of Valentia is definitely one of the highlights of the entire game for me, and the fact that it is so well told and written was especially important given that this was the game that followed the Fates catastrophe, and the whole mess that was the writing of those. Even though I was working my way through the early Fire Emblem games, games when Shadows of Valentia was the big new release. For series veterans, I have to imagine at the time that the obvious care in characterization and world building seen in this remake must have been extremely refreshing. Following the steps that Fire Emblem's Shadow Dragon and New Mystery of the Emblem took, this remake also busies itself with fleshing out the original cast, bringing in a three-tiered support system that helps to display their personalities tremendously. Although the barest amount of characterization for the normal cast would have surpassed the absolute zero that we got from early Fire Emblem games, the writers of Shadows of Valentia really went above and beyond to flesh out these previous empty vessels. The cast here has a collection of down-to-earth but still very entertaining characters, and some of my personal favorites had to be Valbar, who I'd call the Captain America of Armor Knights, Silk, the sweet and well-mannered cleric who is also a total gossip, and Saber, who fits so well into the protector role for Celica that it throws the inclusion of some new characters, such as Celica's brother Conrad, into question. On that same note, while the original cast of Gaiden has been very well built up, I have to say that I'm not at all that impressed with the brand new characters, such as the previously mentioned Conrad, but I'll also include Fernand, Berkut, and Renea under the same umbrella. I hardly mention these characters or cut them entirely in my plot synopsis, because quite honestly, including them or not including them doesn't really change the overall story whatsoever. I'll admit the only reason that I put them in there at all was to avoid the eventual comments that would apply that I forgot about them. I didn't forget about them, they're simply forgettable to me. It feels like these additional characters were included to either bloat up the number of characters or diversity of the cast, like with Alm's new female friend Faye, or to establish the world a little bit better, which seemed to be the case with Fernand, who shows the negative side of nobility in Zofia. I do appreciate this, because in the original Gaiden, at least with the translation that I played, there was very little to dislike about Zofia, with all the villainy from Regel being so much more visible, not to mention actively fought against in the story. Through Fernand, we see the ugliness of Zofia's nobility, so it isn't just the comically evil General de Say who's causing all the bad things there. Berkut and Renea fare a bit better, as they serve as alternate and ultimately tragic reflections of Alm and Celica. Berkut being a noble and Renea being a commoner that he's fallen in love with and ultimately sacrifices for the sake of gaining more power to try to kill Alm. I imagine that if I hadn't gone through this series in release order, I would have a lot more to say about these new characters. One small but very smart way that they are used is to give a little bit of extra context to battles that otherwise would just be filler moments, such as when Fernand and Berkut step in to fight with Alm, replacing what were just nameless soldiers before in the many, many field battles that Alm goes through. 
In general, even though I don't care too much about them, I think the inclusion of these characters was a very smart move, and not one that necessarily overshadows anyone else in the cast, which was the big problem in Fire Emblem 12. Honestly, the balance struck in this game between revision and preservation is pretty close to perfect, and that's just concerning the characters and plot events. When it comes to this setting, there is a far stronger revisionist's hand at work. However, one would have to be a fool to not see the incredible passion that was put into it. In every city and almost every room, Alm and Celica will have plenty to say as you examine even minor bits of detail in the environment, revealing little bits and pieces of their own personalities while at the same time defining the flavor of this world. Sometimes the comments that they make are a little bit overly goofy, but this kind of attention to environmental detail had not really been found yet in the series. This world and these cities simply feel a lot more real, more so I'd say than any other Fire Emblem game has managed to accomplish. All in all, through its improved writing, plotting, and setting, not to mention the beautiful music and cutscene work, Echoes absolutely raises the bar for what the series could accomplish. Honestly, seeing the sadly downtrodden Gaiden get revived in a beautiful and stylish remake that is so respectful of the source material while still keeping a mind towards modernization has been incredibly rewarding for me to experience. Next, we're going to be taking a look at the gameplay and try to find out if the same goes there as well. Before even getting started with my gameplay analysis here, I just have to tell you I am not going to be retreading old ground in this video. If you're interested to hear my thoughts on the changes that were reintroduced here that stayed true to the original Gaiden, like unbreakable weapons, the unique item system, boost shrines, the health-based magic system, all of my initial reactions and thoughts on them are still in my Gaiden retrospective. Today though, I'm going to be focusing entirely on the changes and alterations that were introduced in this specific game. And although this is one of the most faithful remakes I've ever seen, if we're being honest, sometimes to a detriment, there is still a good amount of new stuff for me to bring up. When it comes to what is both new and also significantly changed the gameplay, there's nothing bigger that comes to mind than the combat art system. These are special actions that your units can learn through equipping one of the many special items slash weapons in this game, and then participating in battles until the special action becomes learned for as long as that unit continues to hold that item. In this system, players have access to not only new sources of damage, but also other features of Fire Emblem gameplay that have snaked their way in and out of various releases throughout this franchise's history. So while you can use this to regain the ability to switch position with allies or push others one space away, in general the combat art system gives non-magic based units a way to do a lot more in each battle. Much like the magic users in this game, they do so at the cost of their own health. Combat arts, with their high accuracy, on their own fix a major problem from the original Gaiden, that being the excessiveness of evasion numbers, which could really make life hard for non-magic users. And although while most combat arts just get filed under useful for when you absolutely need to make sure that you hit, much like the trouble with Gale Force and Awakening, there is one of these in particular that stands head and shoulders above the rest, to the point that you can and probably should build entire strategies around utilizing it. And and that, of course, is Hunter's Volley. Hunter's Volley is a combat art available for archers, and it is learned and usable when you're equipped with a killer bow. Obtaining a killer bow in the first place involves engaging with this game's new silver and gold mark coinage and blacksmithing systems, which I'm not going to get too deep into other than that I think this is another good way to handle a smithing system, one that I wouldn't mind see returning in the future. So, once you have managed to get yourself a killer bow, which as a quick example of the blacksmithing means you can simply take an iron bow, spin marks to turn it into a steel bow, turn that steel bow into a silver bow, and then that silver bow to a killer bow, your archer is now able, at the cost of a little HP with each use, use Hunter's Volley to fire off two immediate shots that both have increased hit chance, damage, and critical chance. These shots both come out consecutively, meaning even if a unit is capable of firing back from range, which might not be true because Gaiden allows bows to shoot a lot farther than just two spaces away, they still have to wait until they've taken the full damage of the attacks before returning fire. And that is, of course, they'll only get to return fire if they're not slain outright from the damage alone. 
Because of the increased crit chance, you're pretty likely to get at least one crit hit out of these two shots. Although both being crits is not all that outrageous when you start getting closer and closer to a 50 or plus critical chance on each shot. So keeping in mind that when you crit, you immediately deal three times damage all at once, this one combat art technically has the potential to do two to six attacks worth of range damage before your enemies can even respond. Even in the very late game, there's not too many enemies that can take that kind of damage and not be immediately taken off the board, making archers with this ability a bit of an instant delete button in your arsenal. Broken situations like Hunter's Volley are the exception in combat arts and not the rule. But while your unit's capabilities have been expanded out like this, they are still used within the context of Gaiden's original maps and skirmish battles. Gaiden has long been criticized for the way that its maps are extremely barren. Like with a lot of community-wide complaints, the issue with the maps here is partly true and part exaggeration. Gaiden and by extension Echoes do have plenty of very open maps, but there are also plenty of dense and tightly packed maps that fill out the rest of the game in abundance. While I think there are merits to the way that the wide open maps force you to change up your typical strategies and learn to make your own phalanx like coordinated defenses, constant repetition of this kind of strategy gets old really fast. And the original Gaiden in its dungeons, and especially in Alm's early chapters, had no qualms about repeating and repeating many of these open maps. This is kind of where Fire Emblem 15's absolute devotion to preserving the original's design gets a little bit misguided. Shadows of Valentia added new crafting and skill systems, expanded the world and the items to be found, opened the story up with new characters and character intentions, and all of these things show a willingness to fix the places where Gaiden needed fixing. For some reason when it came to the maps, intelligent systems insisted on absolute recreation, when Fire Emblem has long since moved past such overly open design used so often. Truthfully, I don't think it's the open design that gets under most players' skin. It's the repetition of needing to use the same type of strategy when the same situations keep on appearing before you. As I mentioned, this is a problem in Alm's early chapters, but it also pops up in a different way in Celica's early levels, where she's fighting oncoming pirates with the same boarding plank type setup every time. On a positive note, and kind of the only place where I noticed this, they actually did end up changing the placement of one of the game's major enemies, I'll just say it's Alm's final battle on Chapter 4, only on hard mode, which was a very nice touch and prevents that map from being cheesed as hard as before. I kind of wish this kind of touch had been used a whole lot more. While the story and dungeon battle maps remained extremely loyal to the original, a lot of work has been done to update the explorable dungeons and turn them into sprawling 3D spaces that have plenty of secrets and powerful items to be found. While there are some details of these maps that come right from the original Gaiden, in general, these 3D spaces are pretty much wholly original, taking their original layouts as very loose inspiration. Exploring these 3D dungeons were some of my favorite parts in each of my run-throughs of this game, and I do want to give special commendation to the work done in the Lost Forest area for Celica, which I was happy to see didn't fall into the same kind of north-south-east-west repeating zone puzzle that the original went with. In general, I really enjoyed how Echoes updated the original Gaiden's content in all but a single way, and unfortunately, it's kind of the area where Fire Emblem fans get the snobbiest about. Gaiden's maps are certainly not for everyone, and for even those who still manage to have a good time, it's hard to deny that they don't repeat themselves way too much. Although I couldn't say this in the Gaiden retrospective, because I'd only played one Fire Emblem game at the time, being as far into the franchise as I am right now with this video, I can say that without a doubt, this series has done better in map design for every game since, with no exceptions. Although the new gameplay to be had here in this version of the game has its share of lovers and detractors, no matter what they think, there is still an even bigger overall change to the franchise lying in wait, and let's turn over to that next. Mila's Turnwheel refers to both an item in-game that Alm and Celica use in the story, as well as a new mechanic that represents one of the biggest changes in Fire Emblem's gameplay yet. One that some people have come to appreciate, and some people have come to see as far too coddling. 
The turn wheel, in general, amounts to a new mechanic that allows players to rewind time in the middle of battles, winding back through all the actions and turns that have happened thus far, allowing you to jump back wherever you want, erasing deaths or reversing any poor decisions that happened. Although, thankfully, it does not reset enemy decision-making or hit chance RNG. Ever since the introduction of Casual Mode in the 12th game, New Mystery of the Emblem, Intelligent Systems has been trying hard to open up the Fire Emblem series to a multitude of different kinds of players, and they've done this by including new ways to play. Ways that are entirely outside the original franchise concept of strategic grid-based RPG combat with permadeath. The turn wheel itself is a bit like an extension of classic mode, but unlike the casual or classic mode choice at the start of the game, the turn wheel isn't just a passive addition. Like casual mode, it will only be used if players choose to use it. However, this isn't something that you can just turn on and forget about. You know when and why when you're choosing to turn to the turn wheel. In truth, having the ability at all to reverse bad decisions or unit deaths does completely invalidate the point of playing on something like classic mode where every decision is supposed to matter. But to stop there as an ultimate point is to have a failure of imagination. Unlike with grinding systems, which if they are overused will invalidate the strategic depth of Fire Emblem's gameplay by allowing you to mow down all threats in a way that you can't go back from, Mila's turn wheel at its heart is more of a teaching tool that actually helps to dissuade players from grinding. Players use grinding as a way to have a safety net. They don't want to get stuck in the future, and they don't want their characters to die from some unfortunate accident. The kind of people who are going to grind their characters to near invincibility actually have basically nothing to gain from Mila's turn wheel. Those units will probably never die anyway. Some players want to play on classic mode, feeling that casual mode is too coddling to them, but they do want to have a safety net for when things go really wrong. Maybe a character they just recruited has died, and they're willing to accept that their poor strategy led to that. But if one of their main hard hitters and someone they want to bring into the late game dies, their run is basically ruined and they're going to have to reset the map anyway. Having the ability to go back a couple turns and rethink how you want to do things, at the end of the day, is going to teach that player how they should have done it in the first place. It's basically a faster reset button without the frustration of losing a lot of time and progress. Ideally, a player that needs to use the turn wheel often will find their usage waning as they become more used to the game systems. Basically, this is a quality of life feature, in the same way that adding in a button shortcut that resets the game back to the title screen, instead of having to shut your console down and power it back on again, is a quality of life feature. The turn wheel simply does the same thing in a shorter amount of time, which I applaud. If I could change anything, however, I probably would have liked to see the ability to turn the whole system off in general, as I know that there are going to be players that don't want to play with it, and I do think that necessity is the mother of invention. When you know it's not a single button press away, you're going to play a lot more carefully. Also, it doesn't really fit in this game all that much. True to Gaiden, Shadows of Valentia already has a number of ways to deal with permadeath through its various resurrection shrines. And this is of course on top of the fact that this is just one of the easiest Fire Emblem games in the franchise, possibly the easiest one thus far. And it isn't just because of the turn wheel, the reduction of challenge to be had here stems partly from this game's focus on being very, very faithful to the maps of Gaiden. First of all, in a lot of cases, your new ability to use extremely powerful combat arts against the old enemy setups allows you to entirely swerve a lot of these maps intended choke points. On top of this, it also feels like the developers here wanted pretty much everyone to be able to get through the main game, and so they pushed all of the actual difficult battles into the post-game and DLC. While the post-game tower content adds only the barest amount to the story, what it does do in gameplay terms is give players the ability to face some threats that actually can stand up to what this game gives players to use. It was this content that actually inspired me to start a brand new third playthrough of the game, in order to see what it would be like to play through Almond Selica's journey from the beginning with an eye towards building my post-game team, instead of just using everyone like I've done on all my prior runs. Personally, I think using post-game content in this way is a kind of clever idea. It ensures that most players will be able to experience the whole story, while still giving the other players who are more serious-minded something to grind their teeth into and plan on working towards throughout the main experience. Although this game's hard mode does have a couple of jumps in difficulty, in general I breezed right through most of the battles, and even with all my Fire Emblem experience at this point, I wouldn't say that I'm a particularly great player. 
Even though it isn't really my thing, I do have to say that Shadows of Valentia kind of deserved a lunatic-style extra hard mode. Still, making my way through Valentia again after all this time has certainly been a very interesting experience, and thankfully not one as predictable as I thought it would be. I think I've covered pretty much everything that I want to say here, and it's time for us to finally wrap up and get ready for the very long road that is still ahead of us in this franchise. As the game that is right between two of the largest and most significant releases in the Fire Emblem series, I have been looking forward to Shadows of Valentia for quite a long time as a welcome break from the necessarily extremely complex and extensive analysis projects that the two games that surround this will entail. This is a world that I knew well, with characters that I was already very fond of, and if we're being honest, I knew there was no way that I was not going to also fall in love with this version. Although perhaps I have not brought it up as much as I wanted to by now, I just have to state here that this is, in so many ways, a damn beautiful game. This is evident in its art, the voice work, the UI, the music, just so many ways that are constantly presented to the players with each individual moment that they spend here. To say that Shadows of Valentia is a labor of love is perhaps too simple a statement. This game is a tribute to the fact that Fire Emblem is a series where you can take a game, even one that is a forgotten 25-year-old black sheep, and with a bit of spit polish and a lot of love, show a whole new generation of gamers from all around the world the value of this series' original design. Of course, Gaiden and its adaptation might not be everyone's cup of tea, however, the tremendous amount of other players who have found so much to love in it, regardless of their own history with Gaiden, is a testament to the timelessness of that game and this series. And it's a testament to the love that the developers so obviously poured into it, and wanted other players to have for its world and characters along with them. I am very happy to say that they definitely succeeded. Fire Emblem Echoes Shadows of Valentia is a remake done right, and as far as I'm concerned, this is one of the best remakes in gaming, period. On our next stop in the Fire Emblem retrospective, we are leaving the 3DS behind as we move on to the Nintendo Switch. Join me next time as we travel to the land of Fodlin and take on the responsibilities of a professor in Fire Emblem 16 Three Houses. If you don't feel like waiting, you can watch the Three Houses retrospective right this very second. All you need to do is click the link on screen right now or in the description box to become a Patreon supporter. For as little as $1, you can gain one week early access to my videos, including the Three Houses video which just became available right now. Please consider helping my channel, this series, and future retrospective series grow with your support today. Thank you so much for watching everyone. Big thank you to my top patrons Dink, DW7 Still Rules, Henry Gutierrez, John Morrison, Ryan Poe, and Shin Lu, as well as to all my other patrons. If you'd also like your name to join this list of people supporting the channel, please check out the link in the description. Thank you all very much.